let me move to the subject of the total solar eclipse that's coming up in August 21st of this year. Is there anyone in here that didn't know there was going to be a total eclipse in August 21st of the... I'm so glad because that means I get to tell you about it. <laughs> there is going to be a total solar eclipse in August of 20, uh, August 21st of this year. You have to travel, but it's in the United States, to see it in totality. When a total solar eclipse happens, uh, the moon passes between the sun and earth and it casts a shadow. And you can see it casts a dinky shadow, a little narrow little beam shadow that crosses the face of the Earth. So that very narrow beam will cast a swath across the United States from Oregon to South Carolina. You need to be somewhere in that black band across the middle that says Path of Totality in order to see it total. How Here, wide is it? Uh, oh, gosh. About 100, about 100 miles. Thank you. Uh, here in Los Angeles, it's going to be partial, uh, just under 70%. Let me tell you right now, if you plan to watch it in Los Angeles, you need protective eyewear. So we would love for you to see it, but we would love for you to protect your eyes and keep them healthy. So uh, you know, make sure you do not look at that eclipse. I always have to say that. The Griffith Observatory sells special <laughs> eclipse glasses and the official Griffith Observatory solarama at your stellar emporium. <laughs> That's right, another reason to become a photo member. So, uh, so if you haven't seen a total solar eclipse, however, get thee to thy car and drive to the center line because it is one of the prettiest sights you'll ever see. Um, we have talked about this before. I'm not going to talk about it any further with regard to the uh, details of this eclipse because tonight we have a special uh, segment um, provided to us by Griffith Observatory's director called Devoured by Darkness, and I will let him explain to you why that's so scary and what that means. <laughs> Thanks, Laura. Well, thank you very much. Obviously delighted uh, to be here, and thank you for the invitation to join you tonight. Uh, and as you can already tell, uh, America's national bird is going to be blamed for taking a bite out of the sun this summer uh, <laughs> when the all-American transcontinental total solar eclipse crosses the spacious skies, the Purple Mountain Majesties, and of course the amber waves of grain from sea to shining sea uh, on the 21st of August 2017. The event is guaranteed to capture imaginations headlines, and, of course, personal travel budgets. Uh, today, uh, solar eclipses, are, are they're, they're now mass entertainment uh, and, and, and merchandising opportunities. Uh, in the old days, however, uh, they really were the last thing the ancients wanted to see. Uh, the beauty of a solar eclipse was really not always appreciated by our ancestors. They saw in it instead a threat. Uh, to the order of everyday life, and, and you can appreciate their sensibilities because the sun was going out and it's not supposed to. And, and that really not only is a problem for the lighting, but it also seems to contradict the, the order of all things. To them, the foundation of the world really was beginning to slide toward the brink. And in an eclipse, then, the integrity of the, of the sky uh, was obviously violated. You can trace that word, eclipse, back to the ancient Greek origin, eclipsis. And we learned that to the Greeks then, that means that the event meant an omission or an abandonment. Well, whether either the sun or the moon is eclipsed, uh, it seems to uh, disappear from the sky. It abandons us to the darkness, and of course, people get all upset, as you can see there. Uh, the Bible includes unpleasant e e eclipse imagery. For example, the book of Revelation uh, tells us that eclipses and apocalypses were driven by the same heavy hand. And when St. John describes the opening of the sixth seal in, in Revelation, he reports, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as a sackcloth of hair, and the whole moon became as blood, and illustrated there, of course, in a woodcut, famous woodcut by uh, Albert Durer. Well, the um, concern that, that you heard expressed there uh, from the biblical source just persists, and in fact, just as an example, in 1644, uh, this woodcut illustrated the meaning of an eclipse then, and it was pretty straightforward. Blood, uh, fire, and sword. It really is not a pretty picture. Uh, there are folks uh, lying around, things uh, in conflagration, and presiding over it all, of course, is the eclipse sun. In general, most people uh, were alarmed by the occurrence of an eclipse, or at least anxious about what it might mean. Uh, in the Book of Songs of the Xiqing, one of the five ancient Confucian classics from China, solar eclipses are, are said to be ugly 
abnormal. And, and by the Han Dynasty, which is about 2,000 years ago, uh, Chinese astronomers understood why eclipses occurred, uh, but they still didn't trust them. Uh, they <laughs> nevertheless thought that, that solar eclipses were uh, going to give omens. And that tradition of omens goes back much, much older than, than 2,000 years ago in China. This is the Shang Dynasty oracle bone from the Chinese Bronze Age, uh, roughly 3,500 or so years ago, and it contains a reference to an eclipse on it. Uh, the Aztecs of Mexico also found eclipses to be pretty upsetting. Uh, that does look upsetting. Uh, <laughs> The, the Codex Borgia, which is a, a pre-Columbian divinatory manuscript from central Mexico from around the time of the Aztecs, includes this page. Uh, and this is a depiction of the August 8th, 1496 total solar eclipse in which the sun is being attacked and, and, and is bleeding. In fact, it's bleeding from all its joints. Everywhere you see a, a kind of a rayed disc, there is, is uh, a, a fellow going after the sun and, and giving it trouble. And even after the, the Spanish conquest, uh, Fray Bernardino de Sahagún, who, who really kind of wrote the first ethnography uh, of the New World, and, and in his Florentine Codex, uh, then written soon after the conquest, uh, we can read what happened as far as everybody was concerned in Aztec Mexico when a solar eclipse occurred. Uh, there's an illustration, you can see the Europeanized kind of drawing that appears and it depicts uh, an eclipse almost in terms that, that we would have a couple of discs, but, but don't, don't be misled, uh, this was still not good news. Uh, according to Sahagun, uh, the sun turned red, he became restless and troubled, he faltered, became very yellow, then there were a tumult and disorder, all were disquieted, unnerved, frightened. There was a weeping. The common folk raised a cry, lifting their voices. People of light complexion, this bothers me, uh, <laughs> were, were slain uh, as sacrifices. Captives were killed. All offered their blood. They drew straws to the lobes of their ears, which had been pierced. In all the temples, there was the singing of fitting chants. There was an uproar. There were war cries. It was thus said, if the eclipse of the sun is complete, it will be dark forever. The demons of darkness will come down. They will eat men. It's troubling. Uh, <laughs> there is reason to associate uh, those demons of darkness with star divinities, planets that pop out at totality. Uh, the hostile celestial agents actually appear depicted in, in another one of these codices. This is the Codex Cuspi, uh, which is a divinatory almanac from roughly the same period. And you can see a number of creatures uh, uh, illustrated there uh, in, in pre-conquest style. Uh, spider winged insect, scorpion, snake in a hole, and a jaguar in a mountain cave. And you think, well, those are all just animals. No, those are, are, are actually the star divinities, uh, the, uh, the demons in the sky. And the Codex Magliabecchiano, uh, which is a post-conquest early colonial document from central Mexico, uh, is, is even more disturbing. It provides an image of Tsitsimito, the star demon and you really don't want to encounter her in the midst of a total eclipse. Well, eclipses had impact. Uh, they are visually stunning departures from the natural order. Uh, they, they seem to threaten the continued well-being, even the existence of the world. And, and some people, like the Dang Dynasty Chinese, saw them as a sign of ongoing decay. And in fact, if we look at our own times, maybe the upcoming eclipse is an indication. <laughs> These, these things didn't happen, they maintained, in the good old days when the stronger moral fiber of, of the times inhibited uh, such afflictions. Uh, but you can take sources like uh, the later he Hebrew commentaries on, on the, the book of Genesis, and they indicate uh, that an eclipse occurred on the day that the animals boarded Noah's Ark. I mean, that's, that's trouble, all along with the, the trembling, the foundations of the earth and the lightning flashing in the heavens and, and the boom of thunder overhead the darkening uh, of the sun signaled the end of an era in, in biblical sense. And according to the Voluspa, which is one of the uh, ancient uh, Viking uh, uh, texts, uh, one of the poems of the Norse Edda, uh, illustration, 19th century illustration uh, of an uh, uh, element of that, uh, the sun will turn black at the end of the world. This, in fact, is a portrait of, of Ragnarok, the end of the world. And that end of the world sensibility is hardly restricted to uh, uh, the Vikings of Europe. You find it all over the place. For example, on the other side of the planet, uh, the Tupinamba Indians in northern Brazil, Brazil saw the possibility of world's end in every eclipse.